A romantic visual artist, pioneer, and unconventional designer, Jeff Garner and his sustainable label, Prophetic, are on a path of transformation, leading the evolution of fashion and changing our perception of luxury. Mr. Garner, if you will, or do you prefer Jeff? Mr. Garner, Jeff? Hmm? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, was named one of the top 40 artists in the U.S. and works and his works, his works are permanently placed in the Smithsonian's Renwick Gallery for the 40 Under 40 exhibition. The uniqueness of Prophetic begins with the artist himself. Uh, Jeff's vivacity and his commitment to creating distinct, sustainable, eco-friendly fashion is a reflection of his environment. His ultimate vision is to bring awareness to the toxins found in commercial synthetic fashion, which we're going to get into today, and overall health implications to the human body um, to allow everyone to choose. Um, The brand is established in the United States and is fast becoming the label synonymous with fashion-led ethical design in the UK with widespread praise from mainstream fashion media. A press favorite and prominent voice in the ethical fashion arena, Jeff dresses many many artists such as Sheryl Crow, Miley Cyrus, Taylor Swift, Kings of Leon, Susie Cameron, and many more. He won an Emmy in 2019 for his documentary on sustainable fashion called Remastered found on Amazon, which is a must watch. So Jeff, thank you for being here today. Um, I know that you are currently deep in design mode and we pulled you out. So thank yeah. you for being here. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm glad I made it. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad you made it too. All yeah. right. So that is quite an introduction. You've got numerous accolades and we're going to dive into it. But first we want to start out, you know, doing our homework on you. We know, we know that you grew up on a horse farm outside of Nashville and then yeah. leading into listening to a little bit of your Ted talk, sort of coming full circle into, into some of those things and where you grew up. But I want to talk about your background, like take us back to the beginning. Let's get to know you. That that could be a long time (laughs) now. Um, No, I started, I grew up in Tennessee on a horse farm, simply being around nature taught me like biomimicry, how things, you know, why they're created, how they work, synergy of effect. So I started designing for all my buddies who are in bands or like, Hey, be in our band. I'm like, no way, but I'll dress you. <laughs> and um, so I started doing stage wear and merchandise. Um, so I was designing print t-shirts for the bands and trying to make it cooler than your typical tour shirt. And uh, so I went into the printing and designing the bodies and printing. And I was like, wow, this is very, very dirty. And so I learned really quickly about, you know, just that process and the polymers for the printing process and mm. off gassing and people having health implications and, and toxins off gassing and going through the dryer and the heater and blah, blah, blah. So it got me, you know, thinking using my creative brain to like, okay, let's problem solve the manufacturing. Wow. This, this is not cool. And obviously I have a heart for people, for animals, for, you know, just humankind. So I was like, I cannot do what I love and, or I can't make, you know, these commerce products for my bandmates on unconscious healthy sure. place. So that's when it, you know, I started working on solutions. So, uh, so this was 25 years ago. So, yeah. So at that time, everyone thought it was crazy. And I was like, well, yeah, I'm kind of a hippie, but <laughs> um, I do, you know, I have that problem solvematic brain. My grandfather was an inventor and worked for the Manhattan Project in Tennessee. So, wow. so I was able to come to the table with, like viable solutions for everyone. So yeah, so that's how it began. Okay. And so what was, do you recall back your favorite band shirt that you designed? Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's many. Um, you know, I did this retro Barry Manilow shirt that somebody recently just sent me a picture of like, this is yours. Awesome. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, that's amazing. <laughs> but, but I like kind of the retro stuff when, when the concerts was outdoors and more kind of free love and that kind yeah. of, you know, when people are like hand drawing concert mm-hmm. shirts and stuff like that. I, I really enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the ones we now, you know, pay top, top dollar for because it's going back. It's vintage. Right. And yeah, I hate that's... saying that too about my career. I'm, I'm a, a little <laughs> over 20 years into, and it's like, wait a second. Where did yeah. the time go? <laughs> One of my funniest shirts was there was a Christian band called Audio Adrenaline, and I put dirty on the back and hot, <laughs> and then had this chocolate brown t shirt. And then obviously, they had a song talking about, you know, just cleansing, whatever. But I've, I thought it was funny. It was like a play in words. 
And yeah. then like, I guess it bought my buddy's first house. So that was good. <laughs> oh, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. So you're in Nashville, you're designing shirts. And then what takes you, what, what, what's your next step? Where did you go after that? So I, I left Tennessee, age 17, drove my Jeep to California. Okay. It's a typical, like not being understood as an artist type from family was supposed to go to West Point Academy at a full ride. So I rebelled wow. and mm-hmm owned and I went to the coast. I was like, I'm just going to be a surfer. Um, I had one family friend at Pepperdine and she got me in on a scholarship and then I was able to pay my way through school because my buddy was an actor and put me on his agent and I booked a Barbie commercial and that paid my way through school. So I was able to survive and um, was lifeguarding and um, and then working for the Dean of Students. And then so Pepperdine was super supportive um and i was like wow okay so I, i'm finally supported as an artist because this community was more you know free-spirited in that sense and i could be a long hair and, and not be judged <laughs> so you know now i think it's different but um so i worked for ben, barry manilow fleet with mac and don summer at their entertainment yeah. company wow. and so i started touring with them and doing kind of on a bigger scale what i was already doing and then i learned you know we were doing a lot of cut and sew and doing a lot of you know beautiful formal jackets for barry etc i learned even more how that all operates and works and then six years into that i jumped ship and started prophetic so i wanted to do you know something more have a more deeper you know meaning um and i was I was just starting kind of the sustainable. I started doing prophetic as a sustainable brand. Okay. Uh, so that meant whatever I, I was working with textilers and developing hemp silk, you know, mm. combinations that didn't okay. exist. And, um, you know, I was using plant-based dyes that I really thought I was crazy using. I studied sure. in Italy on, you know, making these beautiful colors. And so, yeah. So at the time I was the kind of, I guess I was one of the first pioneers in the U.S. At least London, they were they had a few designers working and operating that. So I'd go show in London my collections because they understood, and I joined forces with them. We were trying to make it a bigger um, kind of conversation piece, you know, catwalking sure. about marketing for most brands. I was trying to do it for awareness and say, mm-hmm. "Hey, look, you can make this beautiful gown. It looks gorgeous, but it's made of hemp and dyed with indigo and." Giselle rocks it and things like yeah. that. So, um, you know, so that's kind of how it evolved. Amazing. And, yeah. That's great. So, you know, being a pioneer in this space there, what were some of the, the naysayers, if you will, against some of the things that you were doing? Sure. It's always the commerce guys, right? So okay. fashions, you know, I even hate saying I'm a fashion designer because it, it seems like I'm in the commerce business of, sure. and a lot of those brands just knock off real designers and then mimic it and you know put it on whatever and and h&m's are these guys and they just you know it's unfortunate it's not an art form as it used to be um so yeah i don't you know it's yeah i don't want to go down that rabbit hole but um that was one of the major things is like okay unless you could prove that this new fabrication of hemp and silk mix let's say for example that people want to buy it yeah you know i.e. the bigger brands, mm-hmm. uh, you know, these textiles wouldn't turn, turn their big will to make it for me. Yeah, sure. So I was leveraging the band merchandise against that and say, Hey, I'll give you a big order for this. And like, you know, doing a t-shirt, et cetera, if you'll do this fabrication for me. Oh, interesting. I huh. use that for the, the dresses and the couture design. Okay. I was doing like at that time I had a wearable collection. I was doing maybe 90 pieces per style and that was mm. it. Mm-hmm. So, in the eyes of production, I'm just a small, tiny guy that's yeah. going because they have to, you know, think about it like a will. They have to stop production every new totally. year. Right. Yeah. So they don't want to stop it for 90 pieces. They can't mm-hmm. make the buy it, even though yeah. you're paying a dollar. So it's a, that was a hardship. It's like, how, sure. do, how do we get people on board of something they don't believe in, for one? And mm-hmm. to talk to them about the science of it or the health implications. They, you know, they would listen, but they're like, well, this is how we've always been doing it. And look, I'm still living, you know, that kind of talk. Yeah. Yeah. Like, all right. So, yeah. And so interesting when we look back and even look to the future, there's so many things in our lives that we've we've just done it that way. And now we're seeing 
all the harmful effects of just doing it that way, right? Yeah. <laughs> Whether it's things we're consuming or wearing or um, just doing to our bodies physically. So, um, you know, through that process, did you have any mentors that helped guide you? Because it seems very much like uncharted territory. Yeah, no, exactly. I, my first designer that kind of influenced me was jo- Johan Lindenberg, Jay Lindenberg. And then he taught me about detail and about doing things, not for the sake of the sale, but for doing it for the consumer. Okay. Okay. That's a great lesson. And then I had another mentor, Jim, I call him my hippie dad. He was my best <laughs> friend. Um, he just passed last year, but he taught me the idea of higher consciousness and we do things and operate out of that platform and, you know, just talking about karma and just the whole energy we put out and what we give gift to the world. So we make choices, not based on, you know, kind of selfish desires, et cetera. So you kind of guided me that way. Okay. And then I had, you know, retail pioneers like Fred Siegel who mentored me and like, okay, mm. you know, do that, but also, you know, do a sock or do a hemp box or do something that everyone can relate to. Okay. To pull them in. Where? Yeah. Well, that mm-hmm. they could wear and touch mm-hmm. and feel, know the difference. Yeah. You know, it's great to have these grandeur, beautiful couture pieces that people see, but then they want to touch and they want to feel and they want to test and they want to be like, why can you, you know, wear this 10 times and I have to wash it? It's because the hemp's antifungal, antibacterial, you know, mm-hmm. to teach and educate in an applicable way. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Amazing. Sounds like a good roster of mentors. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. So switching over into fashion a bit more, I know that you mentioned, you know, you maybe don't want to be called a fashion designer, um, but what does fashion mean to you at its core? You know, I, it, in my viewpoint, it's a creative art form in which we bring together textiles, dyes, and a a concept silhouette design into living, into a living space. Um, And, you know, there's art for art's sake and art for people's sake. So Mm -hmm. you have these beautiful couture editorial pieces that are telling the vision of your style or what you see, like the feminine beauty or the masculine beauty, you know, and how you define it. And being a straight male designer, you know, I look at a woman's body differently, I think, Mm -hmm. than other designers that, you know, are, you know, and I just think that, like, for example, I think the beauty of a a lady, you know, like her neckline, Mm -hmm. her collarbone, like Mm -hmm. that. So I emphasize that versus, you know, some of these things you're seeing where you're you're barely like almost seeing a nipple or this Mm -hmm. and that, Like, like that's, to me, that's too revealing. So I'm, Maybe it's, I'm more conservative, but I see the beauty differently. Sure. Um, so I think every designer has their own form of that beauty and art. And, um, you know, and I think we kind of lead that design. And then obviously you have the other side of fashion, which is trend set. So they look at our catwalks. So they look at our inspirations that we just kind of download and they put mm-hmm. it into like, okay, how can we, how can we monetize this? How can we think off this, this, you know, Jeff's doing this and this guy's doing this and like, oh, I'm seeing a trend here. Like they're both using, I don't know, Hunter Green in their collections. Mm. Okay, let's do that. So, you know, that's how, so fashion is such a, you know, fickle industry. And that's why I, I use the word prophetic because I want to dive deeper. And, you know, I first started with positive statements on t-shirts and then I evolved it into mm. Sustainable, you know, couture collection, and uh, you know, and pushing that envelope, making dresses out of cactus and seaweed, and just kind of like, wow, you know, this this can be good for you and the planet, you know, kind of opening that door. So yeah, that's wild. I love it. <laughs> Very interesting. Do you have, you know, you mentioned that you look at kind of the male or the female form differently. Do you have a muse that you would would love to dress, have dressed? What is what is someone or something that you've created that you're proud of? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a romantic at heart. And I grew up, you know, and watching Legends of the Fall. And, oh, yes. <laughs> and and these kind of hero, hero type films. And I always struggle with white knight syndrome. And, you know, I had an older sister and my mom was a beautiful kind of Southern belle. And she just, uh, you know, she dressed well, you know, every day and made her own clothes as well. So did my grandmother's and, you know, and I, you know, but they would, they would 
work the land and be in the garden and work the farm, et cetera. So it was an interesting dynamic of like, okay, they had this, you know, hard work ethic, yet mm-hmm. they would get dressed at night. And it wasn't about showing off and it wasn't about them. It was like how they present themselves to the world, like this lace, this, that. And I, you know, I learned that like, you know, you look at these old pictures of old cities and everyone's 1920s, 30s. Yeah. You know, Oh, that's gorgeous. Yeah. You look today, the same picture, you'd be like, I don't, I don't, wouldn't put that on my wall. Cause no. I mean, right. And my friends you make went, fun of me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. My friends make fun of me because like I won't go to like Disney or go to a mall. I've never been like because I call it eye pollution. Like I just cannot because it, it <laughs> I know it sounds funny. You but can't, it, unsee it, right? can't unsee it. And I'm gonna be like, whoever invented the short should be like. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but no, and that's my perspective, obviously. Yeah. You know, I just think we've fallen away from the beauty and art form of dressing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, because that fast fashion marketing cycle, they want you to change your trend yeah. in three months and discard that clothing. Mm-hmm. And that's how they, that's why they, they call it design obsolescence. That's why they teach designers nowadays to design things, not to withstand wear and mm-hmm. tear. You know, interesting yeah like the shirt i'm wearing is hemp and i don't know if you can see but see i patched yeah, it's cool here. yeah but i've been horses in it a hundred times and it got it was used to be off-white and then it got too dirty so i dyed it with indigo and then i patched it you know uh-huh. and this, yeah you know, probably That's the cool. year of it so mm. you know it's things like that that so i don't have to go back you know not that i bought you know i make my clothes but say i bought this i wouldn't have to go back and so right. you know the, the designer's the mainstream designers want you to go back in store and buy more. Yeah. And that's the name of the game. And so that's where that model doesn't work. At some point, it's going to eat itself. There's no totally. way to continue to withstand that, you know, to keep up. There's no way. So I think consumers need to kind of say, hey, I, I want to buy pieces that I'll pass down to my future son. Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. And that's a beautiful thing. Right? Yeah. When do you think that tipping point is that it sort of eats itself? Is it, Are we here? I, you know, on the verge. They've been doing that for years. And obviously, COVID, I think, put a lot of those guys out of business because they couldn't, Mm -hmm. you know, but they've also, you know, they've, they've, they've made their money. And fortunately, they set up a model that people want to follow suit. Even, you know, I don't know if we can ever put that model down because it, unless the consumers get behind it and say, I'm just not going to buy it more but the the you know reality is you know and i talk about this a lot but it's not just about awareness but it's about addiction so mm-hmm. if you have a date this weekend you're yeah. basically addicted. you want to feel good so you want to buy something new and fresh even though this yeah. woman or lady hasn't seen you in it you want to mm-hmm. show up good at point the, you know yeah. and so that's an emotional purchase so it's hard and they don't want to obviously go buy something six hundred dollars is maybe mm. sustainable and it's going to last forever because they're going to wear it for this one date and then probably mm. you know. yeah so it's a hard thing to really break that cycle yeah and plus you de- you're dealing with obviously we're dealing you know with a, an economy that's that's kind of unstable right now so people don't want to spend the money sure and or they just aren't making the money and so there there's that issue as well but because for example, the hemp fabric I'm wearing is about 10 times more expensive than some synthetic fabric. And sure. that's why it is not let I'm saying, oh, I'm prophetic and I should charge X. Mm-hmm. It's not a marketing charge like a lot of these luxury brands. It's a, you know, my fabric costs me X, my dot mm-hmm. plant costs me X and this labor. I have to charge this to stay even. Sure. Even. So it's a true cost. And there was a film that Olivia Firth was a part of years ago talking about the manufacturing we call the true costs of clothing etc but you know we're in and you know again buying t-shirts from h&m zara that are seven dollars that's what mm-hmm. we bought for in the 70s but yeah. gas is more cars yeah. are more, food is more living in you know everything's gone up except for clothing mm, that's, that's, great point. Like, that's not a real cost so my cost if i was using local production and real fabric, or I say real fabric, natural fabric, <laughs> and, you know, doing it in a proper way yeah. it would be, you know, my t-shirt should be $40. That's a mm. real cost if we look at it. I'm paying fair labor, et cetera. So that's what people aren't realizing. Yeah. 
That's such a great point. You're right. It, and it's such an uphill battle from an education standpoint to mm -hmm. change those behaviors. And so good thing we're talking about it today. <laughs> well, that's why I do these things because, you know, to your audience to hear this and, and yeah. just got to ring true because people obviously are more educated now. There's more access to, to knowledge and mm -hmm. So convoluted, and there's so much noise out there. Everyone's trying to grab this. Your phone's listening to you, trying to market stuff to you. Like mm -hmm. people are addicted to Instagram now, so it's like they're, you know, it's just they're just, it's just, you know, it's 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 a hard feat. Yeah. Or so well, when I started 25 years ago. For sure. Would you be so bold to say that fast fashion is killing the industry in some way? I think it's killed the spirit. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the art has has died. And I think even the luxury brands had a pivot that were more doing things in a, in a more wholesome way um, because they had to obviously compete, not compete at yeah. that price point, but at least give a more wearable, tangible collection to the general public so that they could keep going. You know? Yeah. And all the like consumer, like the Adidas and Gucci collabs and stuff like that. I mean, that's a little soul sucking too, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. No, it is. And, and Instagram models and all that. It's, yeah. a, it's a different, yeah. It, it's a different, different world today. Different yeah. worlds. So um, we're in, you're in design mode. Walk me through your creative process. Process. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. So I, you know, obviously I don't know, but I do like, I have a little sketch. Oh, okay. and I do tech sketching and I like, you know, I lay out my fabrics. I usually work on my fabrics first and I bring them in. I'm like, oh, you know, and then I start shaping and doing the bodies. Um, and then, yeah. And then I go to sewing um, and it's kind of that step. And then I'll add trim, add little, you know, like I make my buttons and this collection is called beyond the forest. And I'll be showing okay. it in September, either in Transylvania or my to Transylvania and London. Oh, uh, wow. Amazing. So the, you know, the buttons are made of forged, like I, you know, moss and stuff like that. Um, okay. the fabrics i'm doing some moss on the like as a fabric um i'm doing you know more of the green tones i've been using yeah. marigold flowers mixed in with indigo like a double dye so it gets the kind of blue sea blue greens etc um i've been foraging just locally to see what i can come up with you know you think something may create a green but it doesn't and then you huh. add this variable to it and then it shifts and it's pretty awesome um, that's why I love like the art form of dying. Like there's mm -hmm. so many variables. The fact that I use ocean water versus like tap water for my dye vats, that changes it. The air temperature when I lift it changes it. Mm. Wow. Um, so, yeah. So I just kind of keep flowing. And one night I may think this next morning I wake up and I think this, and I just allow myself that space. Yeah. And so I'm in like an, old 1930s cabin right now I lived in for 25 years in Malibu mm. and I just kind of just kind of zone out yeah it's a and great place to zone out yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> it is. I'm, still, I'm still in tune but uh, you know that's that's kind of I have to you know I tell all my friends and you know and uh, I tell my wife I'm like okay yeah I got you know you just you gotta just leave me be I'm kind of like crazy. Mm -hmm. crazy artist is my time I'm not gonna make sense <laughs> What is the most unexpected thing that you have foraged that made a very beautiful color unexpectedly? Well, um, a lot of barks I play with. Mm, okay. Interesting. There's logwood that gives off a beautiful, like, um, black and eucalyptus here in California is mm. amazing. Um, and, but it can go like a beautiful gold tone and then it can go gray. Uh, but it smells beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was using mint the other day in chlorophyll and that gave me a beautiful mm -hmm. green color, mm -hmm. which I wasn't expecting. And then I tried seaweed, but that didn't work out too well. But again, it's uh, the variables. So maybe it wasn't, yeah. it's like cooking is like, maybe I mm -hmm. didn't add the right ingredients to it to extract it yeah. properly and things like that. So, yeah. Okay. Very cool. What would you find is the most rewarding part of your work? over the last 20, 25 years? It's little things. It's 
like, for example, two days ago, I got a beautiful text message from a mom whose son, um, um, he, he has some health complications and uh, she's been buying him the hemp boxers because mm. he's been allergic to a lot of things and she felt it might work mm. and he tried them and they've been traveling in Europe, I think for the last month. And he's been studying them and obviously um, hasn't been washing them every time. And, and it's worked for him. So he's not huh. breaking out. He's um, loving the fit. He feels mm -hmm. confident in them. You know, it's for a mom and a young son who's been struggling right. with stuff. It meant the world to her. Yeah. And so it's little wow. things like that that I'm like, okay, this connected, this worked, this is amazing. You know, so um, many things to be put together at the, at, at these micro moments to get there, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And honestly, that's, you know, why I keep going. I mean, I, I, you know, I lost my mom to breast cancer. So I believe, and, you know, we, we haven't really talked about, it, but the, the toxins and there's heavy, you know, more than heavy metals in the dye, synthetic dyes, all this stuff without getting too detailed, obviously goes into our skin, goes into our yeah. bloodstream and, and does cause health implications hundred um, percent. Mm -hmm science proves it um there's tons of studies i could send your readers but um you know just think of it this way we were designed to be naked nude yeah yeah so what we put on our bodies obviously there's the skin is very permeable and whatever we put on it goes into it there's not a filter system you know mm -hmm. not like kidneys etc so what we put in our bodies has some filtration the liver etc but you know our skin does not so we've never taken the time to like okay what is this synthetic like stretch totally you know, like rip lululemon panna wearing every day do to me and then you mm. see these beautiful young girls doing yoga every day eating you know drinking smoothies and super healthy lifestyle and yet they're breaking out and you know, dermatitis etc it's because of the tdi and the stretch there's a hormone disruptor and they don't realize that. so you know and again it's like I can't sit there and say that causes that or this cause, you know, because there's again, so many variables. What I can say is this is what's in it. Your body does take it in and it goes in your system, how it affects. Mm -hmm. No one knows, not even you know, doctors don't know. Like it's, you know, the genetic people don't know. like, there's, there's no way to really have a study on that because everyone's environment's different, yeah. it's different or DNA structure, et cetera. So that's impossible. So anybody that says they can, it's just like, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. But what you can say is that these variables will create this, will cause the environment for this, et cetera. Just mm -hmm. like the bras, you know, your lymphatic system is such a beautiful system, but your bras constrict it and it mm -hmm. works like a clock that winds up. Um, you don't have to wind up, sorry. The movement creates the winding, right? And keeps it operating. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's how the lymphatic system works. So if you constrict it and don't allow the movement, it doesn't work. Yeah, and, and the nylon, the synthetic polyester nylon, whatever it's made of, is going to hold all the chemicals inside. And then you got your fatty tissues that act like it's like an incubator or greenhouse, let's say. So obviously that's mm -hmm. going to cause a reaction. So, right. you know, Victoria's Secrets has been sued over 600 times for breast cancer. You know, it's public knowledge, you know, but they don't want you to know that. They say it's the underwire and the bra, which causes, mm. you know, has a radiation from like our phones and that is true, but that's not all their bras. That's, you know, yeah. or all that stuff like that. So it has to do with the fabrications and the dyes. Wow. So, so anyways, that's, that's why I'm still doing what I'm doing. You know, yeah. I want to fly yeah. that flag and get people just to think about it, have an educated decision. Do I want to take this risk? Maybe, yeah, I'm going to plug in my computer and sorry, but maybe the, you know, the idea that, um, you know, I should think about this more and that I should just maybe try something different, you know, right. but right now they don't have that knowledge and our wisdom to know, to ask for that artist. Sure. You know, I'm fine with cotton panties. I don't mm -hmm. need, you know, I'm fine with cotton boxers. I don't need those skimpy polyester stretch ones, you know? Sure. Um, wow. That's so interesting. And such an untapped topic in in mainstream media. it scares a lot of people i've yeah. been blackballed by from events mm -hmm. from speaking at 
the Copenhagen Fashion Summit, um, from TED Talks, which we sure. still we still put ours out there. But it's interesting, yeah, because yeah. They, you know, there's powers that be that don't want this information out there, right? And they usually sponsor these events, you know. Totally. I mean, yeah, and they usually sponsor large mainstream media too, <laughs> in some way, shape, or form. So a lot of money. Yeah. There's a lot of money and a lot of advertising dollars on the table, which is, which is sad, right? Um, it's but sad. it's where we are with a lot of topics. Yeah. Certainly. I always, so. always, I'm lucky. My, my family's, you know, my uncle ran the ATF forever. My other uncle DEA. I'm like, okay, I'm protected. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Can they find you in Malibu anyway? Can no. You... Okay. No, not, <laughs> not trackable. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Yeah, I it, I think it would be on character for you to be untrackable. <laughs> yeah, I can ride a horse faster than anyone I knew. <laughs> I'd like that to seems on that. brand. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, any anything else on the toxicity of of clothing fashion that we should talk about, or as consumers be asking for brands be be talking about more? Sure, I think the simplest thing is just to you know obviously look at the tag, see what's in it. Yeah. Okay. It's synthetic. Stay away from it. It's not mm-hmm. breathable. It's going to have something in there. You can't pronounce that. You won't know what it is, but it's going to have a harmful effect just like in your food, you know, industries, you know, people are more conscious now. Um, but you know, our grandparents used to know what every fabric was. They could touch it, feel it, right. and, you know? Um, and then you also have natural fabrics that are being synthetically dyed. And I say, well, that's kind of like having mm. a wood, wood wall and then you paint on it well the paint's toxic so the wood no longer it doesn't matter that's what's touching your skin so if you're looking for the options you just look for the natural cottons flax linens hemp, etc that are are not dyed okay they are dyed find out what they use for the dye okay but there is some homework in that because they don't Mm -hmm. really want to give that information out because reason being is they're if they're in a commercial space or not doing plant-based dyes is too expensive. Yeah. So, um, get that, and that makes sense. Um, do you think there'll, there will come a time that brands will have to disclose certain materials or certain chemicals in the clothing that we're wearing? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's, that's policy changing policy. Yeah. Obviously it takes a long, they've made a few in Europe there, they got, you know, some good policies going in yeah. effect. Um, it's going to take time because right now, imagine regulating that because right, right now I can make this. Yeah. So my care label into it, nobody's going to check it. There's yeah. no way there's not enough yeah. power. Yeah. So I would say this is, you know, this is silk and it's not, it's hemp, you know, like, yeah. right. you know, say whatever it could be. So then there's an ethic, you know, moral thing to the companies and how do yeah. we check that? I don't know. You know, um, that's what they're up against. It's so daunting. Even, yeah. It's daunting. Yeah. It's like, it's like you're asking for these companies to be, have this moral integrity, be like, we should disclose yeah. what's honestly in our garments and mm-hmm. put a warning on it. If this is known to cause cancer and, or this or that, and just yeah. let people choose, but right. yeah, they're, they're running from that. They're just yeah. trying to avoid it at all costs. Yep. <laughs> and that literally at all cost. <laughs> yeah. Because it makes sense because then they would be out of business. And then everybody's like, well, Jeff, you know, what about that and jobs? And da-da. I'm like, well, then a company that would do right. the right thing will come into play and they'll hire those people that because that's a skill set, you know, sewers and that's they need, you know, everyone needs yeah. that. It just needs to be done in a different way. Yeah. So I'm not worried about, yeah, everyone losing their jobs and, you know, industry. Right. It's just kind of. You right. Know, you, yeah. It's just retooling the job, the, the process, the education, the, yeah. the go to market, all of the things, but yeah, it's definitely an uphill battle, but one that you're fighting. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. I kind of feel like Mel Gibson and the Patriot. I don't know if you ever saw <laughs> up at the scene where like yes. all of the army's running this way <laughs> and he picks up the flag and he's running. <laughs> and you're like, huh? And then like, I doing? Like, wait a minute, the flag's going that way. We're going that way. All right, I guess we'll turn around. And then they yeah. start that way. And then they went. waiting for the tipping point to turn. <laughs> but sometimes I feel like nobody's running with me. I'm like, no. <laughs> dang it, I'll keep running. Yeah. 
And then what's interesting nowadays, you got people trying to be the eco warrior themselves. So mm-hmm. then they're, they're like, mm-hmm. nah, they're not running with you. They're running that way and trying yeah. to start their own. I'm like, well, we're, we need to be on the front together to really create the change, be stronger yeah. as a whole, as a unit. And so that that's causing, you know, diversion. Which is- and does that make your you know, does it make your skin crawl a little bit when you've got those eco warriors and you're like, wait a second, I've been here. <laughs> for yeah. years. You know, I am, I'm human. <laughs> Luckily my hippie dad taught me an attachment. <laughs> that. Okay. But okay. the main thing for me is like, they're sitting on a platform, say at the mm-hmm. fashion summit and they're wearing synthetic fabrics. And I'm like, Oh, you guys, like you need to be like, wow. you need, you're, you're the visual representation and yeah, come on, dude, wow. better job. Fine, if you want to wear that stuff at your home and that's your thing, whatever. But when you sit in front of people talking about a subject matter in which you're supposed to be a leader right. on, you should be wearing it, supporting it. Uh huh. Yeah. Seems basic. To... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Seems basic. Mm-hmm. If you don't know how to make it or don't yeah. know it, call me. I'll dress you. It's fine. It's easy. Yeah. But yeah. like, you know, but that's that's what I'm seeing that it kind of disgusts me. It's just like, all right, yeah. you know, but. And um, and you're seeing things like they're calling it circular economy, where they're trying to keep plastic in use, you know, with polyester. Yeah. I'm like, that should be never produced again. But they're saying, oh, well, you can recycle it and do this, mm-hmm. you know, brain spun and this and that. And it's like, yeah, I, from a standpoint, it's better than new polyester, but you're mm-hmm. still using chemicals to make it still going on people's bodies and creating health implications. Yeah. Again, they can own this technology and they keep the synthetic in motion right. so they don't have to spend the money on the natural. Right. So, yeah. it's like, so we're up against that too because everyone's jumping on board and like, oh, it's recycled bottle- bottles. I'm like, uh, oh, oh, what, what was? But wait a sec. Yeah. 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 Like, wow. Are you sure they recycle that? Because from what I know, like they need to know the exact content and makeup. Like if I want to recycle the shirt, I need to know exactly how much hemp and cotton's in it for mm. them to to be able to use it okay. nobody you throw it in a recycle bin you throw think, it in yeah. yeah i mean are they going to spend that manpower to look at it to analyze it to you know yeah no so that's what yeah so we got a lot of kind of what they call it the greenwashing sure. kind of in the agendas which again create noise and distraction mm-hmm. so that's yep. that's why this movement really hasn't taken root because mm-hmm. all these yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense. Wow. Thank you yeah. for sharing. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, if, you know, can the general public, like, where can we shop your line? Where can we find, where can we support you? Tell our audience yeah. a little bit more about that. Sure. I mean, we, like I said, we have like an intimate collection called Wolf and Rose that I created just for friends, really. Okay. And oh. so when I talk about it, I'm like, okay, I, I didn't have this anywhere to send anyone. I was like, okay, so I do hemp boxers and hemp underwear for ladies right now. Okay. And it's a, it's an entry point, you know, and yeah. the other thing is the, fr- the second thing you can do is change your sheeting in your bed. And the easiest thing to do is change your detergents mm-hmm. because they are the number one polluter, honestly, in clothing um, and to your body. So mm-hmm. seven generations, a great brand. Whole Foods obviously has done a good job of curating yeah. products that, you know, but seven generations, great. Okay. Borax is a natural cleaner, yeah. but you know, those are the first kind of baby steps. So okay. yeah. So if you go to prophetic.com or wolfandrose.com, you can find, yeah. And then I'll make anything for anyone. So if somebody needs Amazing. something. Yeah. So yeah. I love it. That's awesome. It was so fun getting to know you. Wow. You've opened up my horizons, which is exactly the point, right? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Just to, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right. So now we're going to move into what we call the tease quick takes, if you're oh. ready. Oh yeah, I need okay. coffee for this one. I think. <laughs> I think I have a feeling you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, what is a quote that you love? Wherever you are is the entry point. Hmm. All right, and very applicable to your your business, right? I think. To, oh, yeah. yeah. Every, you know, you know, I artists are full full of self doubt all the time, and mm. they're looking for signs to start something to create. Oh. Something. And mm. I'm like. Wherever you are, today is the entry point. Like just I like it. Before. That's great. That's yeah. good. Okay. I don't know if you do a lot of Google searching, but if you do, 
<laughs> what was your last Google search? <laughs> I do not know. I do not know. It probably, I think if it, it probably was an actor or film director I met. Okay. Because I meet a lot of people and mm -hmm. should know who they are. And <laughs> I don't watch TV, so I don't. And I feel, okay. you know, I don't want to disrespect them. Yeah, um, right. So I, I will look them up on IMDb or something like that okay. and, and figure out their, their history and their background so I can speak from a... All you know, right. Yeah. I like it. Um, what is the cringiest trend that you've ever tried? Cringiest trend? Like, <laughs> you might not even be into trends. I yeah, mean, I as far as mainstream. I don't think so. I, don't, I would say <laughs> probably not. I mean, everyone, you know, I've had the long hair and beard for a long time. It was like, yeah, you know. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I do trends. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. great. Okay. These, these are great. Okay. Shampoo bars. Yes or no. Have you ever used them? Don't know what that is. I, yeah. No. Okay. No. Nope. Yep. So. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> this is great. Okay. What animal are you most like? This one you've got an answer for. I know it. A horse. I'm sure. A horse. Okay. Horse. Yeah. As people say lions. I'm a Leo. I'm like, uh, not really. Yeah. <laughs> All right. One is what is one product that you cannot live without? My acai. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I eat acai every day. It's my Do source. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I love it. Um, and advice for those who want to make it to the top of your industry, who want to be a game changer in your industry. Stay true to your vision. Okay. Don't listen to everyone else because they're on their own path. You're on your own path. Mm -hmm. Stick to that and um, believe in yourself and you'll come, you'll come to whatever that is. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I love it. Well, this was so exciting to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming okay. out of, as you mentioned, mentioned design mode. We can't wait to see what you come up with for your new collection. Yeah, that will be September. I cannot wait to either. <laughs> <laughs> I never put it together until the end. So wow. you just hope that the gowns kind of match each other. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. That's incredible. It, it tells a story. It always does. You just have to trust it. So. Yeah. Sounds yeah. great. Well, yeah. wonderful to meet you. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you for helping me bring this out more. Yeah. You you're bet. A great narrator. And, and, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.